Okay, today's session is the right to shoot. My name is Taya Peterson. I've got a very simple job today, which is to introduce our uh, first speaker and our moderator for this session. Before I do, just let me thank our sponsor for this session, which is the Shooters Union of New South Wales. The reason my job today is very simple is because uh, probably more than any other person in Australia, David Lionhelm, Senator David Lionhelm, is the public face of libertarianism. Uh, David is a shooter. Um, I, I've, ha I've actually had the privilege of knowing David for many years, since even before he became a senator. And I think the... Uh, and even before this movement here really was as organised as it is today. And I think one of the things I thought about David when I met him early on was that, you know, oh, well, he's, he's just one of the shooters in the libertarian movement. But that was something of a mistake. David's actually a very deep and broad thinker about libertarian issues and particularly how to bring those issues into the political arena. And I think in that regard, he has been a great success. And I think, unfortunately, some in the media have probably made at times the same mistake about David thinking he is just about guns, but he certainly isn't. He's a very um, eclectic uh, person who's thought a lot about a lot of issues. But David is a shooter, and today's topic is about firearms. Um, so without further delay, I will hand over to David. Please welcome Senator David Lionhelm. <laughs> Thank you, Taya. Um, I regularly meet people who say to me, I agree with everything you say, or almost everything you say, but I can't agree with you about guns. And then they follow up with something like, why do you want everyone to have a gun? When guns are designed to kill, why would you want more of them? And if you didn't talk about guns so much, more people would support you. And then finally, just look at America. That's all you need to know about guns. Unfortunately, almost nobody who says these sorts of things have as much of a clue about the current gun laws. What it takes to legally own a gun, or how to change, uh, or how to use one, or uh, how they would change the law. But if you actually ask, how would you change the laws, they almost inevitably propose something that already is the law. And if you ask them to describe the gun laws in America, they'll be equally ignorant. And as you know, um, what you see on TV is fiction, but you wouldn't believe that when you come to people talking about gun laws. Cop shows are not reality. Today's session will hopefully help those who are willing to listen and learn. For those who hate guns, and I have a term for that, it's hoplophobia, and for the ones who get really animated about it, it's pants wetting, hoplophobia, <laughs> it won't make much difference. Emotion, bigotry, bl uh, bl blind prejudice, and a complete absence of reason are never far from the surface on this issue. But this is a libertarian conference. Hopefully you're all here because you either hold libertarian views or you are at least interested in the libertarian philosophy. So there's hope for you. Our speakers will take you through the current gun laws and highlight their absurdity. They'll explain why the gun laws have done nothing to make us more safe. They will explain why the gun laws are a bureaucratic nightmare to those who want to participate in the shooting sports and why they are the worst kind of laws, irrational, pointless and counterproductive. And then I'll finish at the end and discuss how gun control relates to libertarian values. Um, so I'm going to wrap up now with a bit of a discussion about uh, gun control in the context of libertarian philosophy. When John Howard forced the states to adopt the National Firearms Agreement in 1996, which Graham just discussed with you, he made this comment on Radio 2GB. He said, we will find any means we can to further restrict them because I hate guns. I don't think people should have guns unless they are police or in the military or security industry. Ordinary citizens should not have weapons. Ordinary citizens should not have weapons. We do not want the American disease imported into Australia. Now, many of us hate certain things, spiders or snakes, for example. I'm not over fond of farting in lifts myself. <laughs> but few of us seek to impose our obsession on anyone else. Banning spiders or snakes or even farting in lifts is not on anyone's agenda. And yet, 
Howard imposed his obsession on the rest of us. Now let's as assume for a moment that imposing an obsession on an entire country is not a sign of a personality disorder. Let's assume it was rational and considered. And on that basis, there are three assumptions implicit in Howard's comment. First, he assumed strict gun, gun laws lead to gun control, which in turn leads to reduced levels of violence. Second, he assumed there is an American gun culture, which could and should be avoided. And third, he assumed it was perfectly okay for the government to have all the guns and for ordinary people to have none. I'll deal with each of those ones briefly in turn. The first of these is simply false. If gun control was effective, the, country, the countries with the most stringent gun laws would have the least level of violence. Or conversely, a lack of gun control would lead to gun violence. Many people point to the US to argue that point. In reality, countries like New Zealand, Canada, Switzerland and the Czech Republic have far less stringent gun, gun laws than Australia. And yet, their murder rates are pretty much the same as ours. According to Howard's logic, they should have far higher levels than us. In fact, the gun laws in the Czech Republic are really quite similar to many in the American states. It's easy to obtain a gun, and it's not dif difficult to obtain a permit for concealed carry, and yet their murder rate is no different to ours. As for the American gun culture, what you see on TV or in movies is not reality. In fact, the cities and states with the most stringent gun laws have the worst gun violence. In Chicago and Washington DC, for example, it is virtually impossible to obtain a gun, legally at least, and yet they have gun violence far higher than parts of the country where guns are barely restricted at all. In Vermont, for example, you don't need a licence of any description, and yet it's safer than Australia. Why is this so? There are all sorts of theories. I've heard it said quite often that if drugs were legalised, the level of violence would immediately plummet. But I'm not disputing that taking the country as a whole, Americans do kill each other more than people in comparable countries. In fact, their murder rate without guns is substantially higher than countries like Australia, even with our gun crime included. So it might be more accurate to say Americans have a murder culture rather than a gun culture. And as I said, other countries which have gun laws similar to those in America do not. Switzerland and the Czech Republic clearly show this. You can have your own opinions, but you can't have your own facts. The bottom line is there is simply no correlation between gun control and murder rates. You cannot look at gun laws in a country and make a prediction as to its murder rate. And finally on this America versus Australia comparison, I want to briefly, briefly deal with this frequently heard statement. Since the gun laws were introduced, there haven't been any massacres. Graham touched on it uh, as well. The reality is it's a straight out lie. Since 1996, there have been 16 mass shootings. Of these, six involved two victims, five involved three victims, and five involved four or more victims. <coughs> now, those who promote this story keep changing the definition of a massacre. Only recently I heard they want to make it a massacre uh, uh, apply only if there are five or more victims, so they can keep saying there haven't been any massacres. And of course, the victims must be dead. If a dozen people were shot and wounded by a machine gun, it wouldn't qualify as a massacre. But what I mainly want to discuss is this notion that only the government can be trusted to own guns. That is, unless you have a badge or a uniform granted by the state, you and I shouldn't be allowed to have a gun. Or if we are allowed to have one, it's viewed as a privilege rather than a right. So strict conditions are imposed, such as the type of gun, the calibre, magazine capacity, how many guns you can own and what you can do with them. And if it's a privilege, obviously something, uh, it's something that can be taken away from you as well. How you view that depends on your perception of the government and its relationship to us as individuals. 
Is the government like our parent? Not only in charge, but keeping us safe from bad people and bad things. Or, and given it can't always know who the bad people are, keeping, is keeping guns away from anyone who isn't under the government's control the best way to achieve that? <coughs> Including people like you and me. Or are we adults largely responsible for our own safety and also in charge of the government? And even if we wanted the government to provide some protection, we wouldn't want it uh, to, in, to be so, uh, so perfectly safe that, uh, that we would tolerate the level of intrusion and the closeness of the police that, that would be necessary to achieve that. This is a fairly fundamental, fundamental question. And it, it helps, I think, at this point to get a little bit philosophical and compare the thinking of two giants of the Enlightenment, Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. One or two of you may have heard me discuss them previously. Hobbes thought the natural state of man was, a perpetual, was perpetual war, with life nasty, brutish and short. In his view, the only way to achieve civilization was relinquish all liberties to the sovereign, who then gave them back to us as the sovereign decided, or some of them at least. Hobbes also argued that the sovereign should, argue, uh, should rule with due regard for the desires of the, of the people. But he was very clear that ultimate power remained with the sovereign and that the sovereign was the source of our rights. And when the government wanted to limit those rights, it had every right to do so. Now, John Locke had a quite a different view. He believed man is peaceful and industrious, but to establish a society in which private property can be protect, protected, it's necessary to relinquish certain liberties to the sovereign. However, this is a very limited and conditional arrangement. Only sufficient powers as are required for the preservation of life, liberty and property rights ought to be relinquished. An ultimate power remains with the people. Basic rights are inherent and if the sovereign gets too controlling, the government's powers can be reclaimed. Now Locke heavily influenced the American Declaration of Independence, as well as its Constitution and Bill of Rights. The intention of the Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms, was to ensure that people not only had the right, but the means to reclaim power from the government if it became necessary. Thomas Jefferson had exactly that in mind when he famously said, I hold it that a little rebellion now and then is a good thing, and as necessary in the political world as storms in the physical. And he also said, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. Jefferson was clearly anticipating the need to reclaim rights from governments. He was a lock-in. All of which raises the question, how is it possible to bring an authoritarian government to heal if you don't have any means to do so? People say, why would you need to? We don't have secret police, concentration camps, imprisonment without trial, or any, any of the other attributes of a totalitarian, totalitarian society in Australia. To which I would respond, we have had its instances of imprisonment without trial and attempts to ban certain points of view. But I'm still, I am not suggesting the Greens are about to win power. <laughs> and I acknowledge we have not had a totalitarian government in our short history. Nonetheless, look at today's peaceful, democratic Germany. Look at lovable, chaotic Italy, or lazy, tax-avoiding Greece. All three of these endured horrendous, authoritarian governments in the 20th century. And guess what each of them did? They restricted gun ownership to people over whom they had control. Party members, police, military. So, a self-respecting libertarian needs to ask, do we trust our government enough that we would relinquish all means of resisting on the basis that something similar could never happen in Australia? Many Americans don't trust their government, and that's in a country where the separation of powers with its checks and balances is far more secure than it is in Australia. In countries with recent experience of totalitarian government, in Eastern Europe, for example, distrust of the government is huge. 
The second libertarian I want to ask, uh, libertarian question I want to ask in, in relation to gun control is this. If we are dependent on the government for our protection, are we really free? Are we really autonomous, self-owning individuals? Because unless we own our own minds and bodies, they are not our own. Libertarians mostly don't dispute the need for the state to provide for the enforcement of criminal law, including peace, uh, police and the judiciary. But does that mean we each abrogate responsibility for our own safety, our protection, and leave it to the state? I don't believe so. Libertarians accept personal responsibility. Since 1997 in Australia, we have been forbidden from carrying anything for self-defence. Our legal right to self-defence is clear, but having the practical means is prohibited. If you are skilled in martial arts or happen to be a chef carrying your knife to and from work, you might be fine. But most people, particularly women and the elderly, are defenceless. And there's a more sinister aspect to this. If we are not permitted to use our own judgment as to whether to exercise our right to self-defence in a practical sense, how can we possibly be trusted to vote? Isn't electing the government, with all the power it has, a far greater responsibility? Now, just to be clear, I'm not suggesting everyone should carry a gun. They're not for everyone. And even in countries where they are uh, legally available and they can be legally carried, less than 10% of uh, those eligible do so. But I am suggesting we should have the right to do so, if we wish. At least you are competent if you are competent with it and not a violent person. But I am arguing that everyone should have a right to non-lethal means of self-defence, such as taser, taser, pepper spray or mace, if they want, without requiring the permission of the sovereign. Australia's gun laws don't reduce violence. That's no surprise. They don't in any other country either. They don't reduce suicides either although they might change the means by which people kill themselves. What they do is reinforce state power over us as individuals and create a position of dependency on the state which undermines our democracy. There is a lot more that could be said on this topic, but if you haven't figured it out already, let me spell it out to you very clearly. If you believe in strong gun control, by definition, you are not a libertarian. Thank you very much.